Um, actually, as you remain standing, we're going to go to uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, and again, the title of today's sermon is Fear and Faith. Hear now God's word. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is God's word. Amen. Let's quickly go to the Lord again in prayer. O oh, Father, we need your help and the guidance of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, to illuminate this chapter and this text to us so that it will always be profitable for us and that we could apply it to everyday life. Thank you, God, for our families here, for our mothers especially, as we remember them, as we honor them, as we lift them up in service, but also in prayer. And may you continue to watch over them. May they persevere and endure through life's difficulties. And may they truly see the contentment that can only come through relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. The Lord be with our church as we humbly uh, sit under the proclamation, the preaching of the gospel through your holy word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Mark chapter 4, this is one of my favorite passages, actually. Uh, please be seated. Excuse me. We're, we're getting it all mixed up today. This is one of my favorite passages from all the Gospels. I'm not sure exactly why, but perhaps it has something to do with my struggle with deep fear at certain points of my life. And I find this passage very comforting and comforting to my soul, probably even since my youth. And I hope this would be true for you too also today. Last year, Dr. Nielsen and I spent a month in Sunday school teaching on the matters of the heart, and what common struggles we share inwardly as Christians. We, we covered discontentment, anger, and also fear and anxiety were discussed. And so last week's sermon and this week's sermon again address the matters of the heart. Anxiety, fear, through some well-known passages, Philippians 4, very familiar to many of us here, and then today, Mark chapter 4. Now, whenever we discuss topics that can delve into the mental spheres of life, that could be difficult and tricky. Last week, I mentioned that there are hundreds of books when I go to Barnes & Nobles on dealing with depression or anxiety, and I did note that some can offer good practical tips on, on dealing with some of the symptoms and some of the struggles. But I did say explicitly, none can offer what Paul pointed to in Philippians 4, the peace of God that transcends all understanding. But let me just say at the front of today's sermon, we are, of course, speaking about anxiety and fear in the usual common life generalities, because we all encounter these things as human beings and also as Christians. But some who are here, or maybe some who have been streaming, when anxiety, depression, or debilitating fear is too overwhelming, we want to affirm you and say there is help. You could speak with me as your pastor. You could seek the help from a good Christian counselor. And there are, of course, psychological physiological, biological things that can be addressed through professionals, licensed practitioners. And so please hear me that I'm not saying to those that deal with clinical ailments in our body, in our church body, 
that truly need medical or professional help, please hear me that I'm not just saying, oh, just pray more. Because we indeed live in a fallen world. Even our ailments, however personal and hurtful, are a result of our fallenness. And so as your pastor, please hear me that we want to care for you. And everyone handles life and the ups and downs in a variety of ways. And the stigma of counseling and getting professional help is lessening and lessening over the years. And I think that's a good thing. So you are not less spiritual. You are not extra weak if you need more help. And although I'm completely not a professional in regards to clinical ailments, I hope that I could at least hear you out, pray for you, open up the scriptures with you, but also point you not just the care, to the care of the church, but also to the right help along the way by God's grace. I, I thought that pastorally I should share that as we talk about the matters of the heart because we don't want you to suffer alone. But the bottom line is, thanks be to God that the Bible does address all of these things, all the matters of the heart. And we need to constantly look to Christ and to his word for guidance and help in our time of great need. And that includes our bouts with anxiety and fear. Now, if I ask you to come up to the mic and tell all of us what you fear or what you fear most, I'm sure there'll be some common answers and perhaps some very unique types of fears. Some of you might say you fear about your future a lot. Some of you might say you fear you'll, you'll never really find a true purpose in life. On a lighter note, some might say I fear clowns or I've had two friends that had a very, very big fear of seeing anything with spots or polka dots and I just, I couldn't understand it. But sometimes fear is that way. It's very unique to people, it's very personal, it sometimes transcends our own understanding or logic. Well, for me, I've, I've shared many fears with you, embarrassingly, over the last year and a half. Roller coasters comes first to mind. But I've also said a couple of times, I have a great fear of open waters. And I imagine I would have been just as petrified by what the disciples encounter in today's narrative, one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. And as we go to Mark 4, allow me to explain some of the just simple background context. These boats that were used in the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus and his disciples were some 2,000 years ago, were roughly about 26 feet long. They weren't huge things. They didn't have motors or bathrooms or kitchens below deck like we have today. It was just a bare-boned wooden boat. And some of the disciples were professional fishermen and were accustomed to these smaller vessels. And we'll explain why Jesus and his disciples get on the boat in the first place in a minute. But with that backdrop, let's look at verse 35 again. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with, the, with, him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Now, this was, a, it was typical for the ministry of Jesus Christ. He, he would spend a lot of time ministering to people, either teaching his own disciples or to the massive crowds that were finally uh, um, uh, gathering more and more as, as kind of the, the fame of the name of Jesus, uh, our Jesus, spread across the region. So he was preaching, he was teaching, he was spending loads of time with people to the point where he would be exhausted physically, emotionally, and he would have to frequently go away with the disciples to get rest, recuperate, even for physical safety. Now, I'm not sure if the other boats that were there were with them were just followers, but that's not really needed for interpreting what is happening here. But look at verse 37 again. A violent storm erupts quickly. The Sea of Galilee, some of you have traveled to this region, is still known for this today. Because it's many, many miles below sea level, it could create a lot of abrupt windstorms in chaotic waters. And storms over water, of course, can affect sailing rather abruptly and suddenly. You can't really prepare for it. It says here that waves were breaking into their boat. May that never, ever happen to me. 
Now, the boat was already filling with water, so obviously you would assume you'd be scared out of your mind, even if you didn't have a huge fear of water. But let's pick it up again in verse 38. Where was Jesus? But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Remember that line, because it's very important to the whole of the text. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? First of all, this shows, on one hand, an element of the fact that Jesus is truly the God-man. Truly man, truly God, truly divine. He was 100% human, 100% divine, as we'll see his divine power in a moment. But Jesus, like you and me, needed sleep. He was human. He wasn't awake 24-7, healing and teaching people. And as John Calvin noted, he wasn't pretending to sleep so that he could test them. He was actually asleep. He needed to recuperate physically. He needed to get away, regain physical strength, something all of us can be reminded of, that we need this. Yet a glimpse into his divinity will show that in this narrative that he is divine because he is not afraid of precarious circumstances that come about in life, even if waves are crashing into your tiny boat. But on the flip side, it is his disciples that are scared out of their minds because they think they're about to perish. Don't you care that we are perishing, about to perish, teacher, rabbi? You'll notice that it wasn't just one of the disciples that was scared out of his mind. It says they collectively woke him up and said this to him, don't you care? Oh, we're all afraid. And if you look at all the synoptic gospels, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, side by side, if you just, even on your computer, just copy and paste and put it side by side, you'll notice that Luke 8, Matthew 8, only give the account that the disciples woke him up and said, we are perishing. It's a very shortened version of what we find here in Mark chapter 4. But I'm so thankful for Mark 4 because I'm glad we could see the human side of these disciples in a more microscopic way in the Gospel of Mark. Actually, I learned this in seminary some 15 years ago, that the Gospel of Mark, one of the main themes in that whole Gospel is discipleship failure, that they're exactly like us, that they struggled with trust, that they wanted to do what was right, but it always sometimes would do the opposite, and they're failing and failing and failing over and over again. And here they question the goodness of God, the goodness of their Savior, the goodness of their teacher. Why don't you care? You see, friends, we are human beings, and humans naturally have a sense of fear, feeling dread. We call this a natural, carnal fear. Now, we don't all experience fear at the same level as other, but we all experience in some way natural fear. But the first point that we should make is this. Number one is this. When Christians get wrapped up in natural fear, we often, not all the time, but we often blame God for not being there for us. Let me repeat that. When Christians get wrapped up in natural fear, we often blame God for not being there for us. We say in our own way, don't you care that we are perishing? Or have you ever said, God, don't you care that I'm so afraid of what's next for my job? God, don't you care that I'm so afraid of getting a significant other, that I'm so afraid of the future, that I'm so afraid of, of what's going to happen to my health or to your children, that I'm so afraid at my crumbling life all around me? Don't you care? Perhaps we don't say that all the time. But often, we might think like that. If you even read the Psalms and the psalmists, if they're brutally honest with the Lord, they sometimes ask these questions too. Where are you? Don't you care? Well, Jesus has a response for this. Look at verse 39. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. A picture even reminding us of Philippians 4 last week on anxiety and the peace of God. You see, Jesus continually proved his authority and his divinity in the days that he walked on earth, especially in the front row view of his disciples. He, dis he healed diseases with a touch or even with his words. He exercised demons. He 
could even command nature to do his bidding. Jesus had authority over physical nature and also the spiritual realm. He proved over and over again, oh, this is the long-awaited Messiah, the Lord, over all. All he had to do in this moment was say, peace, be still. Now, obviously, the disciples are relieved immediately. I would be too. I can only imagine what I'd be doing after seeing this miracle happen. But I'm sure there was utter relief and utter joy. But Jesus uses this as a teaching moment for the disciples and for us today. In verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Oh, the disciples are failing over and over and again. Instead of Jesus abandoning them, he continues to teach them, but sometimes he confronts them. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Or in the Greek, it says, why are you so deloy? cowardly, timid, fearful, if we want to literally translate this. Have you still no faith? Now, I've, I've preached this passage over many, many years, but as I continue to preach it, there's always new things to, to glean and to chew on and to find and discover. And I found something John Calvin said that I thought was helpful that I didn't previously see before. And he said this of this kind of fear and timidity. John Calvin, the great reformer, says, quote, Is every kind of fear sinful and contrary to faith? First, he does not blame, he does not blame them simply because they fear, but because they are timid. Mark adds the word so. Why are you so timid? And Calvin goes on to say it's natural to have fear. But the disciples quickly turned that natural fear into dread. And that's where the word so makes a big difference. If I asked you all to raise your hand if you've ever experienced a feeling of fear this year, we'd all confidently raise our hands. But would you admit that sometime this year you were caught in the so part? Oh, Robin, why are you so afraid? Meaning Jesus would ask us, Why are you in this pit of dread? Calvin is saying that this sense of fear is not a sin itself. It's allowing that fear to turn into mistrust. And I think if we're honest with one another, we all struggle with that temptation. And I'm not ashamed to say that there were points in my life. You could meet me in the office or whatever, grab coffee. I could share all the points in my life that I've allowed natural fear of certain things turned into borderline despair, mistrust, and full-fledged fear. And although Christ never let me go through those points, oh, I did sway back and forth in certain moments because I was allowing the fear to take greater and greater root in my heart. And so if you want to visualize this, natural fear is simply the sprout peeking out of the soil. Spring is, I think spring is here. And so, so what, what, you know, we're gardening and we kind of see the, the first shoots sprout out. That's, that's what we call natural, a natural response to life. But mistrust and dread is the full bloom of natural fear, if you want to visualize it that way. Some, th- something our, our Savior rebukes and calls us to turn away from. And so I, so I did. By God's grace in those very dark moments of my life. And I hope you can also. I know you can. By the power of God. As we'll all confront this sooner than later. Some of you are saying, you know, I haven't really hit that point in my life yet, Robin. Where I felt full bloom fear. But perhaps there will be a day soon or in the future. Or even the distant, distant future. And I pray the Spirit will remind you of Mark chapter 4 about this concept of natural fear turning into or being tempted into full bloom fear. And so big picture here, he's asking his disciples about faith, hence our title today. This is not so much about fear, actually, this is about faith. But faith in whom or what? He is not asking, Peter, Andrew, don't you realize this tiny boat can handle a lot? You guys are... Fishermen, you know this. No, he is asking them why they don't trust him. Because that's what faith is 
When you bring it down to a simple phrase, it's a simple trusting and believing. And so the second point we see here is that, number two, the antidote to natural full-bloom fear is faith. The antidote and solution to your life of fear of things or what is to come is not, oh, be stronger, Robin, or be a better person, or just get over it. No, it's have faith in the one who is in control. Brothers and sisters, it is so much easier to be stronger, to will it, to say, I'm going to pull myself up by the bootstraps and just get over this fear. It is way easier to go that route than to humble yourself and say, oh God, help me remind, help me be reminded of just basic faith and trust. You are in control. Oh, if life will continue to be topsy-turvy for me, I know that eternally I am safe in your hands. Believe, trust in the person and work of Christ. This is the whole point of all his ministry on life when he was going in the Galilean region and then on his march all the way to Jerusalem, teaching people in his parables, I, I'm right here in front of you. All of these things, all these teaching moments is to point to himself that he is trustworthy and that he is Lord of all. He is mighty to save. He has authority over all things. And as most of these disciples are going to see, trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross and in his resurrection. And also, as we have just learned, don't be ashamed to acknowledge that you have natural fear about things, but ask the Spirit's help to not let that turn into despair and mistrust. I mean, even at the most basic level, as some of you have children in elementary school and you know, my sister always talks about all her four children and as they've grown up in different stages, always had different phobias and different fears. Big or small, we can teach even children to say, you don't have to let that fear consume you or overwhelm you to the point of despair. Trust in Jesus. Look at verse 41, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. It reminds us of Jonah. Remember those last year, last summer, of the pagan sailors that converted to believe in God because they saw the power of God at hand. They were filled with great fear. What happens after God gives you faith by his grace as a free, unmerited, divine gift to you? It's this great fear. And that's the thir third and final point today, this morning, it produces the true fear of the Lord. Faith organically and naturally and spiritually produces the true fear of the Lord. And so when we believe that Jesus is truly Lord of Lords, having the supremacy over all things, you get filled with, quote unquote, great fear. Now, this is actually different. Some of you guys take particular note of these kind of things. This is in the Greek. It's a different word used in verse 40 of you remember, being afraid. This word is from, in, in verse 41, the root word phobos. We get the word, of course, phobia from it. It's obviously different than how we use it in today's context. It's a, usually a negative connotation when we hear, hear of phobos or phobia. But the essence of its meaning is reverence, a sense of awe, respectful. It's a different kind of fear. It's a godly fear, if we could put it that way. Psalm 111, verse 10, you could write down that reference. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Oh, but like most of us, we need that phrase to be unpacked a little bit more. What is the fear of the Lord? Well, Michael Reeves, uh, our men's group, studied this last year. In his books on the subject, says the fear of the Lord is not a negative thing. Let's recapture what it actually means biblically. He says, quote, The fear of the Lord is an intensely delighted wondering at God, our creator and redeemer. An intensely delighted wondering at God, our creator and redeemer. He says elsewhere, quote, This type of godly fear is not a gloomy fear marked by anxiety, but a heartfelt and happy enjoyment of God 
as creator and redeemer, end quote. You see, this word in the Old Testament in Psalms and then earlier in our meditation passage from Proverbs this morning is the same translated word found here in Mark chapter 4. This godly fear, this fear of the Lord, this is a fear to be desired, actually. This is not a scared, natural fear that we associate with as humans. This is a supernatural fear that is in awe of Christ for who he is. He could even command the seas and what he has done and what he continually does on our behalf. And part of it is faith being activated in us through his spirit, recognizing who God is and what he does allows natural fear to turn into godly fear, something to live by, 2 Timothy 1.7. I'll read this quickly. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, this is a carnal natural fear, of, but a power and love and self-control. And so our response to this gift of faith is not a stagnant one. It's supposed to be challenged and indeed strengthened as we grow. This is why Jesus confronts them. He doesn't just give them a hug and say, it's all going to pass, it's all going to pass, and everything's going to be fine. But he confronts them. Why are you so afraid? Oh, be strengthened in your faith. Because indeed, Christ challenges my faith, your faith, all the time. Challenges, but yet also at the same time strengthens, strengthens faith that trusts in the work of Christ, believing in him. And as one author says, this greater fear overcomes all natural fear of what is to come, what you dread. Now, of course, until we get to heaven, it's, it's, always, it's not a perfect kind of equation. But yes, the fear of the Lord helps us to overcome natural fear of what you dread. Remember that one of the disciples' main fears was being forsaken. Jesus, may you never die. Well, why do you keep talking about going into your death? Stop talking about that. Stay with us forever. We're going to have a great, great life together here on earth. That was one of their main fears of being forsaken. Well, Hebrews 13, the author says, Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Or Isaiah 41, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. And of course, Matthew 28, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We mentioned this before, but the most frequent command in the Bible is to not be afraid. Some of you, most, maybe some of you guys don't know that, but fear not is the most frequent and repeated command in all the scriptures. And I've read a reference that the command of fear not is used 365 times in the Bible. I mean, that is significant. Do not be afraid. Fear not, God says, I'm the one who helps you. Jesus never promised a life free of suffering or problems or strife or bouts with natural fear. He promised that he'll be here for us, never to forsake us, to be for us and not against us, to strengthen our faith in him. That, in, that inevitably drives out carnal fear that blooms to the sin of mistrust. Paul Tripp, a, a wonderful Christian counselor, preacher, author, says this, that faith is carrying with you such a deeply rooted fear of the Lord, fear of God, that you have hope and courage in situations where you would have once been afraid. And so does fear of him overwhelm any other fear you would have? I look back at my life in all those moments of dread and of the dark night of the soul and of irrational fears or all-consuming fear, and I would have to say, yes, that when I started to realize my faith in Christ, oh, that could overcome any other carnal fear that you have. And I say that with complete honesty and being upfront with you, if, if that was the opposite case, it would be hard for me to preach that and just say, yeah, that, that's possible, but in my heart saying, no, it's not possible. No, I think in my life, in those very difficult moments, oh, the fear of the Lord, that delighting in the wonderment of God, the happiness that I feel, 
when thinking about my union with Christ, the Son, the Savior. Yes, at the end of the day, it overwhelms and quiets carnal fear. Paul Tripp says this. It's, I don't like reading lengthy passages, but I think this is very helpful for us. Paul Tripp says, quote, You see, your greatest difficulty doesn't exist outside of you. Your greatest difficulty, difficulty exists inside of you. The greatest storm in your life is not a storm of nature. The greatest storm of your life is called sin. The waves of sin beats at the borders of your heart. And like the disciples in the boat, you have no ability to, in whatsoever to beat it. It's only awe of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, a recognition of the sufficiency of his sacrifice the Christ that will give you hope in those moments when you are faced with the reality of your deepest difficulty and you're faced with your inability to defeat it. Do you run to the Lord for the peace that only he can give? End quote. Very helpful to say, am I just going to get myself out of the rut of fear or am I going to turn to the Lord, the Prince of Peace that only he can give? And so how would you cultivate greater fear of the Lord? By trusting, resting, believing, aided by the Holy Spirit, but also by obeying all that he has commanded, abiding in him, reading his word, and trusting it and obeying it. And this bleeds into our application portion that I'll jump down to what we talk about a lot here is the ordinary means of grace. That through the ordinary means of grace, what, what are they? It's prayer, it's prayer. It's meditating on God's word. It's sitting under the proclaimed preaching of God's word. It's the sacraments. Once a month, we, we administer the Lord's table in communion. And I always say down there, I, I always repeat, you probably are not going to feel any bit different, but something is happening to your faith when we partake. Something is happening behind the scenes in our souls and our hearts that our faiths are being strengthened and so when we miss out on that or when we refuse to partake or when we say you know I'm just too busy or I'm consumed with my fears so I'm not going to go to the Lord in desperate prayer or sit under his preached word or, or read it for myself that's when we start to see natural carnal fear take a foothold and I've seen that in my life I was talking to my sister years ago and she had some certain particular fears at that moment. And she said, Robin, I'm actually, I'm doing okay. I said, how? She goes, I think, I really think it's because I'm in God's word more these days. And she was someone that's kind of had ups and downs in terms of walking faithfully with the Lord. But I was almost surprised, pleasantly surprised, that she said that. That when I'm near to God's word, some, somehow the fears are not as loud any longer. And so don't neglect the ordinary. It's, it's termed ordinary for a very particular reason. It's not jumping through a thousand hoops. They're very ordinary ways to experience the grace of God. First Peter 5, Peter says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because this is completely the opposite of what the disciples were feeling at that time casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you he does care so keep that in mind brothers and sisters on this spring day when maybe things are all calm but when the stormy waves come crashing at the borders of your heart again, to remember God's word. FDR in 1932, in his presidential inaugural speech, famously said, the only thing to fear is fear itself. The worldview that the goal is just to be strong in your resolution. Don't even acknowledge fear. Avoid fear at all costs. But for Christians in our worldview, we embrace our Christ in faith and confront natural fear, not by avoiding it or just saying it's not there, 
but we confront it by the aid of the Spirit. And as we trust in him, dear friends, God gifts us with the ability to have a greater fear, a godly fear, a fear of the Lord that is happy and delighted in the truth that God is creator. Oh, he is redeemer. He is in control over all things. And to be reminded as we leave here, think of such things. And when we say with the disciples, and I'll close with this, don't you care, God? Don't you care that we are perishing? Oh, hear the words of Jesus. Jesus cared enough to go to the cross for me and you. That's how much he cares. And so, brothers and sisters, however you're struggling or however low you're in the pit right now, oh, there is hope for you. There is hope for me for those moments where I say, oh, God, that fear is starting to bloom. Oh, Lord, would you help me conquer it by the fear of the Lord, by strengthening my faith, by tasting and seeing that you're good, by seeing the increase of grace in my life. And that's all that we could do. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we, we've been talking a lot about heavy things, matters of the heart, anxiety and fear. Oh, but Lord, I pray by the power of your spirit that we will be overwhelmed with a happy disposition as we leave this place. A joy that the world does not understand. Perhaps we might not be laughing or smiling ear to ear, but an inner happiness, an inner joy, knowing that we belong to you, that no matter what life, no matter what happens in life, oh, that our faith is secure in you, that you will never let us go, you'll never forsake us, you'll never leave us to our own devices and in our own sinfulness, you'll never leave us alone in the sprouting fear that we all encounter daily. So thank you, Lord, for that reminder. Thank you that you have taught us about faith, but also the fears that we have leading to the fear of the Lord, that you are the acknowledgement that you are creator and redeemer, and that's all we need to hear. We thank you, Lord, for this Sunday service that we conclude with singing, with a benediction, but may our days be filled with a reminder Oh, that you are Lord and that you do care for us, so much so that your son laid down his life for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing.